All right, guys. Hello. Welcome to our second Fridays with Darren. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some frequently asked questions that we get related to solar. We're very excited to be able to share this with you. Um, before we get started here, I just want to remind you that next week, we're going to be talking to two very special guests, which this is our first time having some guests on the show here. We're going to be speaking with Gray Reed and Phil Stoddard, who are some local environmental heroes. Uh, Gray's going to be speaking about her work looking at climate change by factors of 10, which shows a historical context to um, an otherwise what can sometimes be very confusing process of looking at solar and historical uh, historical timelines. So we're going to be digging into that. Uh, but like I said, this week we're going to be getting into solar FAQ. We have Darren here. Hello, Darren. Hey, how's it going? Um, Darren's just going to be answering some questions that we frequently get around solar to help try to clear it up and give you uh, more sense of confidence as you're looking to understand what it means to go solar or maybe as you're looking to recommend somebody who might be interested in solar. Um, before we get started, what's what's been going on with you this week, Darren? How are you doing? It's been a busy week. It's been a pretty exciting times. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we're seeing is a lot of interest in battery backup as we approach uh, hurricane season. So, you know, we, we've got COVID-19 that we're all dealing with, and then we're about to have a pretty nasty hurricane season. So a lot of folks that already own their solar systems are saying, huh, maybe now it's time for me to add that battery backup so that instead of what I thought about packing up the family into a car and going to, you know, Sarasota, for example, and just having a little vacation and, and coming back, if, if the, you know, if the grid gets knocked down, now maybe they're saying, mm, I want to continue to shelter in place at home, and I already have the solar, I just have to add the batteries, and we're getting a lot of interest uh, specifically on battery backup, but it's, uh, it's been a busy weekend. It's exciting times. Uh, you know, we're all still battling out COVID. We're all very hopeful that we're nearing the, the tail end of this, but, you know, renewable energy and, and battery backup are two things that, that certainly help uh, combat that. Right. And you know that firsthand because you actually have solar and power walls, battery backup at your home. A absolutely. So I've had my solar for about three and a half years. So for about three and a half years, I've seen my $9 FPL bill being, you know, totally net zero. And then uh, about a year, about two years ago, I bought, I bought a Tesla, like, like a car, like a Tesla Model 3. And then I had that peace of mind to say, not only uh, am I producing renewable energy for my home, I'm also uh, charging renewable energy into my electric vehicle. So now I don't have to go to the gas pump anymore, which is cool. And then about uh, six months ago or so, I installed uh, three uh, Tesla power walls on my house. And now uh, I have backup power. And so I show this to customers all the time. I do what I call a simulated grid outage, which essentially means I turn off my main breaker and I replicate or simulate what it would be like if the grid went down. And I can see my power walls kicking in like that in a millisecond, in a couple of milliseconds. And really my first response when I first got these things is I can't believe I ever lived without it. All of a sudden you have that peace of mind that is you know, Armageddon can come along and take down the grid and, and, and I'll be unfazed. I'm, I'm rocking off of my batteries. And it kind of reminds me of what it must have been like when people first got seat belts in their cars. Like, I never thought I needed this, but now that I have it, I don't know how I ever lived without it. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I think one of the questions most asked related to whole home battery backup is, how long does my battery backup last? And of course the answer is, I mean, if you have solar, the answer is. So the, like, right, it, it, exactly. I mean, it really comes down to how was your system engineered? So I like to start with the assumptions, assuming mm -hmm. that you already have solar, assuming that your solar is net zero or near net zero, meaning your system is designed to produce as much energy as you need. If you get batteries, in most homes, they're gonna need two power walls if they have one main breaker and one electrical distribution panel. If you get batteries, if you get those two power walls and you are net zero, your system can last indefinitely, you know, for, for, for in theory for days and months, as yeah. long as you produce enough energy within your consumption. Because what the batteries then need to do is just get you from sundown to sunrise. And during the day, right. your home is gonna be powered by the solar, you're going to be producing enough solar to not only power your home, but top off the batteries. And then once you get into the next day, you're just going to go through that cycle all over again. And 
it's nice. You're, if you already have solar and you don't have batteries, you're already halfway there. All you have to do is get the batteries so you can bottle up the energy and use them in an outage. And this is pretty exciting. I think you had said that you had seen that work because you didn't realize that you had left your main distribution panel off and it was like several days of the solar being on. Is that, am I telling the story right? That's exactly it. Yeah. So, so I had a, a prospective customer over at my house and I was showing that simulated outage. I like to stand uh, outside my house on my little side yard. And what I do is I tell like a potential customer, look through my window at the lamp. You're going to see the light on and listen for the click of me turning off the main breaker. And when you hear that click, I turned off the main breaker. And then you'll know that we're now in backup mode. And, and the reason that I show it this way is I want to show how quickly the switchover is, what that transition's like. And so we do that. The potential customer's looking at the lights through the window. I shut off the main breaker. You hear, you know, the thud from the breaker shutting off to off, the main shutting off to off, where I thereby shut off the grid. And you see just like a little flicker of the lights, and that's it. Then you're in battery backup mode. And a couple of cool things about that. The first one is now that I'm, you know, sheltering at home, I'm, I'm working out of home. I've got my whole computer, my whole rescreen set up here at home. And so you can actually also see the computer screens through the window. The computer screens didn't even do anything. Okay, my halogen light uh, flickered, but the computer screens didn't even do anything. And, and all of the clocks I have on the microwave and the toaster and the oven and the, 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 the receiver, none of those zeroed out. I, normally every outage you have, you know, it zeroes out at 12 o'clock right. midnight. You have to then reset all the clocks. You don't even have to do that. That's how uh, uh, quick uh, this is. So, so for your story, I shut off the breaker and then I did my demonstration. Customer, the potential customer left. I got distracted, started making dinner and I totally forgot that I shut off my main breaker. Completely forgot. So I had been disconnected from the grid, I want to say for about three days. And then one day I was talking to another potential customer and I pulled up my, uh, my Tesla app to show what that interface looks like uh, with, with the Tesla power walls. So for example, you can, you can see the, the power flow right here. So mm -hmm, I pulled this app mm -hmm. up and I saw that the grid was disconnected and the solar was recharging the battery and the battery was powering the house. I said, wait a minute, I'm still in an outage. I've been in an outage for three days and it didn't even occur to me. I didn't even think about it because I was powering the whole house from the battery. Every time I flipped the switch, whether it was a fan or an air conditioner or the dryer, the car charger, it worked. And so, yeah. you know, that's, that's what it's like to be in backup mode. It's, it's like as if nothing ever happens. And that's why we're right. so, uh, so excited about power walls. Yeah, to me, that's the definition of seamless is if your clocks don't reset. That's the threshold. There you go. There you go. Well, let's, let's get on to the questions that, that uh, we frequently get from, from customers or people who are interested in going solar. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And for those of you who are hanging out with us, as Darren answers the question, I'm going to try to pull up some things to, to show in the screen share to help um, illustrate the things that he's talking about so that you can see instead of just hear. Um, and, um, but the first question that we get is, what can I expect during a solar sales consultation? So if I book a consultation, what am I getting myself into? What is that going to be like? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and the, really the thing that I want to stress here is that the the it's it's all about customization and by customization i mean the sales appointment needs to be customized to the customer's uh needs or the customer's level of knowledge solar is still very new to most people uh and and so the sort of gap in, or, or the variability in the knowledge about solar in the general public is huge i've sat down for consultations where people ask me if this is gonna heat their swimming pools because they're confused between solar photovoltaics and solar thermal. And I've sat down in consultations where the customer was educating me about things that I didn't even realize. I've heard questions about what in nanometers is the bandwidth of light 
that can be captured and, and, and converted by, by solar PV. So, so in short, it, it, it's, really gonna, it's really gonna vary really widely, but, but it, it, it's important to me to emphasize to customers that you should not be shy or timid about asking those very uh, you know, specific questions that, that you have. So when a sales consultant goes into a, a meeting, into a consultation, you know, there's a couple of things that we know we always need to touch on, that we always need to explain. We need to explain what is net metering, okay? Net metering is the mechanism of how we buy and sell energy with the grid as needed to make up for the discrepancy in timing between the consumption and production. For example, we'll overproduce during the day, backfeed all that extra power to the grid and then take it back at night. We're gonna explain about the basic differences between the basic types of solar systems. So there's a grid tied system, which is what I just explained. We're buying and selling energy with the grid, which doesn't have batteries. So if the grid goes down, the, uh, the, the solar system is gonna have to turn off to not accidentally backfeed energy on a downed grid and, and endanger uh, power line workers' lives trying to fix the grid. That's called a grid tied system versus a grid tied battery backed up system, which is the same thing plus batteries so that you have backup power if the grid goes down. So we're gonna explain about net metering, we're gonna explain about the types of systems, we're gonna explain about the different products, why we use this type of panel, why we use this type of inverter, why we use this type of rail. We're gonna explain uh, about our flashing, okay? Flashing is how you waterproof the penetration into the roof where we structurally mm -hmm. fasten the system to the roof. Uh, you know, so, so in short, it's really the opportunity for the homeowner to have all of their concerns uh, addressed. You know, there's, there's so many things that, that, you know, somebody can worry about when they're getting a solar system. We live in Florida, we have hurricanes. Is this thing gonna blow off my roof? What is it gonna do with my homeowners association? What is my, I'm sorry, what, with my homeowners insurance? Um, I live in a, in a community, I have a homeowners association. Is my HOA gonna be okay with this? You know, and we can talk about the Florida Solar Rights Act. You have you have rights to have your solar panels and people can't say no. So so in short, there really is volumes and volumes and volumes of things to discuss about solar. We don't we don't want to waste anybody's time. We also don't want to leave uh, a consultation if a customer still has a whole lot of questions unanswered. So really what I want to what I want to impart our potential customers with is this is your time. We're here for you. We're educators. We're here to make you feel really comfortable about this product. We know it's new. We know you might be out of your comfort zone. So we're here for you. Don't be shy. Ask any questions that you need to. We can dive as deep as you want into into any subject. Um, we're also going to do some demonstrations. OK, so we have to size out a solar system for you. I always tell my customers, be prepared, uh, log in to your online uh, FPL account, or if you have another utility that maybe doesn't have a nice online interface, have power bills ready for your last 12 months. We wanna know how much energy you consume because that's how we're gonna know how large of a solar system to design. Uh, I see you just pulled up this software, Helioscope. That's beautiful. This is, uh, this is the software among, among other tools that we use to size out a solar system. So this is, this is really neat for us. Basically, and this would we, happen during we, a consultation, right? Abs absolutely, yeah, real time. Because because this is our customer's house. We want to make sure that they're getting a system that they're comfortable with. Everybody's needs are different. You might have a customer that says, I absolutely don't want it visible from the street. I don't like how it looks. Can't go on the front. We need to know that. We don't want to put panels uh, on the roof for a customer that doesn't want panels. Another customer might say, I don't care where it is. I think it looks cool. I feel very passionate about the environment. I have no problem announcing to the world that this is a solar powered house. In fact, I'm excited about that. I want it to be visible. So, so we want to go over these things with our customers, right? By using Helioscope, we're number one, having that discussion with our customers. Here's where we propose to put them. Are you okay with that? Do you have any input on their on their physical location? Which, by the way, the customer is not committed to anything, right? It, it's still mm -hmm. going to go through detailed engineering way down the line. It is the customer still going to have plenty of time to change their mind? But it's it's where the dialogue starts. But the other thing about this software is we're using satellite images of a home. We're drawing out the the the, the location of the roof and and the limit points, and, and then we're inputting what the tilt and orientation of that roof is. So for example, if you wanna click on that field segment, we can see here that the uh, azimuth of the roof is 175. 
which is almost perfectly to the south, right? Perfectly to the south would be 180. We can see mm -hmm. that the tilt is 33 degrees. So we're going in, we're putting the site-specific information. Because it's a satellite image, the software knows the latitude and longitude, so it knows its geographic location. We specify the product off of the drop-down menu, which Helioscope has a library that contains every solar product on the market. So it knows where the panel's going. It knows its, its configuration. It knows what the products are. After we've selected the panel uh, in the field segment, we would then go to the electrical. We would specify the inverter. And what the software does is allows us to run a simulation. So you can, you can uh, yeah, we're going to place the inverter. You can go ahead and save it. And then, and then it's going to run a simulation. And what that simulation is going to do is it's going to actually estimate the amount of energy that this system would produce. So power is a sort of instantaneous measure. Power is the rating of the system. But what energy is, is the long term, is the cumulative uh, amount of energy that, that the system produces. So this system that, that you just drew up here really quickly, the 7.6 kilowatt system, would produce in a year 13.27 megawatt hours or 13,270 kilowatt hours. And not only is it telling us a total annual energy, we can see the energy production month by month right here on this, on this monthly production chart. So what we're gonna do in a consultation is we're gonna take that total annual energy, we're gonna divide it by 12. So we have the average monthly. We're gonna compare that to the average monthly energy that's consumed by the home. And we're gonna go back and redesign. It's sort of an iterative process until we can make those two numbers match. So what we want to do is have a system that can produce the right amount of energy that the customer needs. We don't want to overproduce because you can't really capitalize on that excess production. We don't want to underproduce if we have the amount of roof space available. You know, we're going to have a dialogue with our customers. Maybe under certain circumstances, you do want to oversize the system. Maybe somebody's going to tell us, ah, I'm going to buy a Tesla next year. So I want to get a couple more panels uh, than, than what my current consumption is. And then we can talk about that. We can say, well, we know that a Tesla is going to use about 250 watt hours per mile or about 0 0.25 kilowatt hours per mile. So how many miles do you expect to drive on an average month? And then the customer will tell us and we can factor that in. We can take that into consideration and, and we can design a system not only based on what your actual needs are at present day, but based on what the projected needs are if there's going to be any major change in, in the energy needs of, of the home in, in the near future. So that's what we're uh, there for. And so we're going to do this. We're then also going to show what all the tools are. We can we pull up spec sheets. We show about the panels. We show about the inverter. Uh, yeah, Dane, if you have a solar edge available, that, that would be kind of a neat thing for us to show. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we like, we like to educate our customers about go, – go ahead and just type in there golden. You can you can pull up my house and and that's what I like to show in my consultations. Yep, just go ahead and search it and so when you get solar, it's an amazing investment, but there's a catch. That catch is that it has to always work, and not only does it have to always work, every single individual component has to always work, and that's where this online monitoring platform comes in. So here's my solar system. You can see on that right corner. Uh, a drone image, and we do this for our customers. So, so that's my house. It's the right side of that townhome. We're seeing real-time power production. So that's how much power the system's producing at this very second. It's that left uh, column, that, that, that 10.26. Then in the middle, you have how much the home is consuming. And then what you can see is what's happening through the bidirectional net meter, what's, hap what's happening with the grid. So if the, if the system's producing 10.26, Scroll up real quick. No, just, yeah, scroll up. Just look, there you go. If the system's producing 10.26 and the home is using 0.96, then 9.3 kilowatts uh, are, are going back to the grid. And, and this is a very nice visual uh, demonstration of how net metering works. And then on the top bar, you see daily energy. So again, this is energy, not power. This is kilowatt hours, KWH, which is an accumulative number. So this is the daily energy, the monthly energy, the lifetime energy, and then the lifetime revenue. So how does lifetime revenue work? Well, the inverter is counting kilowatt hours, units of energy. We're going to put in on the admin portal when we get this set up, uh, what the price of energy is based on the local utility. So 
FPL, uh, you know, the residential rate is usually about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And so what we do is we put that in on the admin side and then solar reg basically multiplies the amount of energy produced by the value of the energy. And then that's how we know the revenue. So part of the consultation is of course, the economic model, the life cycle cost assessment. And this is, you know, the way that we can actually demonstrate that, that our assumptions, you know, are, are, are grounded in, in, in reality. This isn't just something we make up. We have actual systems we're actually monitoring that we're constantly testing our models against. So if you scroll down, um, this system is really cool because it not only has a production meter, it has a consumption meter. Go ahead, uh, scroll down just a little more and then uh, stop right there where it says power and energy. You can hit the, uh, go up just a tad. Just a little bit more, there you go. So, so now under power and energy, you can go ahead and change today. and then go one day back. So you're gonna see on the bottom where it says previous day, but well, you could do it that way too, yep. So what this is doing is this is showing us what happens one on one single day. And so we've got the red area, we've got the blue area, we've got the green area. And so the red area is import, in other words, uh, power that I bought from the grid, I, I pulled from the grid, which is either before the sun came up, after the sun set, uh, so that's red, that's what I take from the grid. Green is power that I give to the grid because it's because it's power that I produced in excess of what I needed. So I give it to the grid. And then blue is what's called self-consumption, which is power that I produced, but I used right then and there. So it never made it to the grid. So you could go one further day back. You can hit the, the exactly. And, and this is a much nicer day, right? So yesterday was a really rainy day. And you can see the bell-shaped curve. That's the outline of the solar production. So out of all of the solar production, some of it was used immediately on site. Some of it was sent back to the grid to go against the power that I would later take from the grid. So if the green area and the red area are equal, then it was a net zero day, which you can see uh, right here in the bars right above that, that graph that it's just about equal. Okay, the export was 48 kilowatt hours, the import was 44 kilowatt hours. Regardless of what self-consumption is, if import and export are equal, then it was net zero. So in this particular day, 513, the day before yesterday, I produced four kilowatt hours more than what I consumed. And then if you want, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom and we can show uh, production mm -hmm. month by month. So my system went on at the very end of 2016 which is in purple. So you can see just a little blip of purple mm. in December. So it went out the very end of 2016. And then that orange, red, blue, and green is 17, 18, 19, 20, respectively. So you can see uh, it's been on all of 17, all of 18, all of 19. And here we are through the first half of May. So you've got May mm -hmm. as a green bar that's about half the length of, of the other years. And so go ahead and Got scroll it. up to the top of this. We can, we can quickly show the uh, energy dashboard. So what's special about the inverter that we use, SolarEdge, is not only can you see real-time data, you can actually see panel level data. So we're gonna check out the dashboard. And now what we're gonna see is the amount of power that was, that was produced by every panel individually. So go ahead and go to the time segment, change the daily view to weekly. And then you can hit that show playback. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a timeline of how the system did in 15 minute increments. So now it's five, nine, it's nighttime, six in the morning, panels start lighting up. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. It gets to the center at noon, which is the peak. The panels are the brightest. And then the sun starts to set. Now it's midnight of 510. This is a really lousy day. That curve didn't make it high at mm -hmm. all. And basically uh, on the 10th of May, it just rained all day. So a perfect day is a nice, smooth, bell-shaped outline. A really bad day is, is what you see on, on May 10th. But, but this is how we help our customers protect their investment. So what we want to do is empower our customers. We want them to understand the tools. We're not just putting something on their roof that they have to take our word for works. We're putting something on their roof that they can see works, that they can understand how to make sure that it works and call us if there's a problem with it. Uh, and, and, and not only make sure that it works at the system level, make sure that it works at the individual component level. Because it right, has to, 
this is available to customers. This this whole dashboard, right? This is something that everybody has in their pocket on their cell phone. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, we as a contractor, our account has about eleven, almost eleven hundred systems on it. So we are monitoring all of our customers' systems. So if a customer calls us with an issue, we're going to go in there, we're going to see what it is, and we're going to be out there in a couple of days, and we're going to fix it. But our customers can can all um, monitor their individual systems. So that's that's a way to, you know, check out your system, make sure it's Let's, doing what it's supposed to do. While we're here, um, one of the questions that we have on this list is about how can I understand the uh, – so, so just, just to cap that off, th this is all kind of stuff that you'll be shown in a sales consultation. And I, I think one of the things that in a sales consultation, just to add on before we move on, is that you can get this kind of specific to your – house level information like maybe you could call and speak with somebody or research and you could find general information but darren if i'm right in a consultation you're really going to be able to look at the, the the information that's specific to how much energy you use specific to your roof you can get like an actual for you what does solar look like is that is that would you say that's about right that that's exactly right yeah solar systems are not one size fits all they they are completely customized cool and so when you're there with a consultant and, and these these consultants that we send out, they're they're experts. They've done they've done hundreds of consultations. They've heard every question. And so for me, it's not just a sales pitch. Obviously, we're there to sell a contract, but it's it's also a, an opportunity for education because our objective is to educate our customers. We want well-educated customers. We want customers that understand the advantages of going with Golden Solar, that understand why we use um, Solar Edge versus other brands of inverter, that understand why we use the uh, panels that we use versus uh, other brands of panels. So, so it's very important for us that we have educated customers that have been empowered with understanding the, the benefits of what we do. And, and, that's, and that's what we're there for. We're there to, to give our customers that, that knowledge. Yeah, I think the people I'm, you know, I think through the consultants that, that work at Golden, they are people that just genuinely enjoy talking about solar. So I, it definitely feels very educational. I want to get to this um, question number four here, because I think this ties in to your kind of tour of Solar Edge that we were just looking at, um, which is back here on the dashboard. Uh, you know, there was a, a documentary that just came out that kind of challenged, like, does solar really have a net environmental benefit? Um, and I think down here, what Solar Edge has done for us, if you want to talk about this a little bit, Darren, um, these are some pretty big numbers, even just for an individual system. Am I right? You, you're absolutely right. One of the things that's happened since humans have industrialized on planet Earth is we have gained something that we now call our carbon footprint. And that's something that we really just started talking about pretty recently in, in human history. And that is you know, your footprint on, on, on the beach when you walk and, and you leave an impression in the sand, that's your footprint. That's something that you caused to happen as a byproduct of your actions. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about the carbon footprint. Um, it isn't always necessarily carbon in terms of CO2, carbon dioxide. Uh, sometimes it's carbon equivalents like methane or, or, other, or other, you know, carbon uh, uh, equivalent gases. But basically everything we do has an impact on the environment. Every time we fly somewhere, every time we get in our car and drive somewhere, when we buy commercial goods, uh, we have an impact on the planet. Now, we have, in our lifetime, kind of put that at the back of our minds, not, not thought about it at all. But now it, it's kind of a turning point in human history that we're starting to hold ourselves accountable because we, jan we, we just can't continue with, uh, with business as usual and expect uh, this, this beautiful, bountiful earth that, that we all live on to continue to be here to support our lifestyle if we don't change our lifestyle. So mm -hmm. that change starts with accountability. In other words, starting to understand the impacts, the effects of our actions. And so that's what people talk about when they talk about a carbon footprint. Now, when we use energy that has a carbon footprint, because when we flip the switch, we might not think about that much. We just say, hey, I turned on the light and I have light and then we pay our power bill and, and it's all good. Well, that's sure. That's in our little you know, microcosm. But but in the in the bigger picture, uh, something had to happen for that light switch to go on. 
and and more often than not in in, in present day uh that thing that happened was something was set on fire and that something might be gas that something might be coal that something might be garbage that something might be uh you know wood chips right if it, you know it might be organic matter but something something was probably lit on fire so that you can enjoy your electricity and so uh, we want to offset that. In other words, we want to still be able to use electricity. We want to still have the light switch go on. We want to still have an air conditioner go on. We want we want to have all the conveniences of modern life, but can we have those conveniences without having to light things on fire and put out gas into the air? And, and that's really why we do solar, right? We do solar because we want to be able to continue enjoying our lifestyle while not lighting things on fire. To, to provide our electricity needs. Yep. Uh, and, and so that's where, that's where solar comes in. Solar is renewable energy. You know, yeah, obviously it, it takes energy. It takes mining for raw products to manufacture a solar panel. But once that solar panel is manufactured and installed, you can use it day after day after day after day to produce electricity cleanly because the sun comes up, the solar panel receives photons from the sun on its surface, and, and there's a, 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 a photovoltaic effect that creates, uh, you know, current and electricity. And so what Solar Edge is doing here to help people appreciate that is creating this little table here that shows environmental benefits of equivalent trees planted and uh, equivalent pounds of CO2 uh, emissions offset. Now, right. I just want to point out here, this is sort of a generalized kind of average number because the true carbon offset of solar is really going to depend on the location that that solar was installed in because different utilities have different mixes of energy sources. And so if you offset, you know, in my case, it's gonna be uh, whatever number of megawatt hours. So if you offset that number of megawatt hours, it's gonna have a different carbon offset depending on what your utility would have done otherwise to give you that much energy. But at a general, but at a general level, uh, that, that little solar edge uh, factor shows us what, uh, what we're offsetting. Yeah, I, I, think, I think too, you mentioned, you know, the, the sunk carbon cost of making the panels. But you, then you said, like, once they're made, they continue to produce energy day in and day out. What's the talk to me a little bit about, like, the lifespan, um, warrantied life or, you know, is this five years, 10 years? Like, how, once you make these and put the energy into it, how long do they produce clean energy for? Yeah. So, so this is something that's really, really cool and really uh, important to talk about. Um, you know, we if we're really going to talk about holding ourselves accountable, then, then we really have to look at, you know, every aspect of everything. And, and yes, there is some carbon needed to manufacture solar panels. And, 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 and yes, that's a conversation worth having. Uh, but, but it's important to emphasize that, that, like I said, once it's, once it's manufactured, once it's installed, it, it doesn't, it doesn't burn any more uh, energy, you know, in terms of the, the product itself. So, so then we have to look at the life cycle of, of a solar panel. Solar panels, are warranted for 25 years. That's a long time. Think about how much energy you're going to consume in 25 years in your home. A lot, a lot, a lot of energy. And that's kind of one of the things about how we got to where we got today in terms of our impact on the environment. When yep. we started burning wood and coal in, in the planet to, to, in the industrial age to, to satisfy our, our energy needs, it didn't seem like a big deal then. And, you know, we just fast forward a couple hundred years and here we are. I mean, one of the things that, that environmentalists talk about is this analogy that if there's a frog in water and, and you slowly heat it up, it's just going to stay in that water until, until it's boiled. But if that frog jumped into boiling water, it would jump right out. And so, and so that's kind of the problem of, of where we are today. We take for granted how much we've really impacted this planet because we were born into this and we just, and we just carry that tradition. So, so this is now the time for us to course correct. And so the, the panel has no moving parts. You know, one of the questions I frequently get is what kind of maintenance do I have to do with my solar system? And I like to kind of challenge my customers and say, well, what kind of maintenance do you have to do on your car? 
And they said, well, I got to change my oil. I got to rotate my tires. I got to replace my tires. I got to do my brake pads and mm -hmm. my windshield wiper fluid. And I got to do my windshield wiper blades. And I have to, yeah, there's a lot of maintenance. But guess what? There's a lot of moving parts. So in, in mechanics, mechanical engineering, where you have movement, you have wear. And where you have wear, you have things that either have to get lubricated or, or pads and things that have to mm -hmm. get replaced um, and things that have to get oiled and, and oil that gets dirty and has to be replaced. Mm -hmm. In solar, none of that is true, right? In solar, this system is 100% stationary. You mm -hmm. have solar panels that are fastened to the roof that receive light in the form of photons from the sun. And, and within the solar panels, basically electrons get excited and start moving along the wires per mm -hmm. the photovoltaic effect. Um, there's no moving parts unless it's a, you know, tracker solar farm in, in a utility scale. But, but for rooftop solar, you know, residential, commercial, for all intents and purposes, there's no moving parts. So these systems that are warranted for 25 years can easily last for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And so to me, that's, that's just amazing. The amount of energy that, that, that can be produced over the lifetime, there is not even an inkling of doubt in my mind that the solar panels will offset enough energy to justify the carbon footprint of their own production. What's their efficiency guarantee uh, up, to that, up to that warranty? So, so it changes from panel to panel. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all solar panels have two parts to their warranty. There's a product warranty and there's a performance warranty, also known as a, you know, degradation warranty. So the regular product warranty can vary between 10 to 25 years from, from manufacturer to manufacturer. Product warranty essentially says this product will not just spontaneously stop working on a given timeline. Um, but the production warranty uh, says that while panels do naturally degrade, they warrant that the panel will not degrade more than a certain amount. So the panels, our go-to panel brand is Hanwha Q-Cell. The degradation on Hanwha Q-Cell is 0.54% per year, which puts the panel at 85% of what it originally started with at year 25. Gotcha. To me, that's not that bad. Yeah, I don't know anything else with a 25-year warranty, much less that it'll work. 85% as well as when it was brand new. It, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, how many people have their TV or their car or their dishwasher or any other appliance from 25 years ago? Very few people. So, so these panels are going to be 85% of where they started 25 years ago. And, and just right. one thing I want to emphasize, if you want to scroll up on, on the Solar Edge uh, portal mm -hmm. and go to the, the layout, that 25-year... 85% performance guarantee mm -hmm. says that if a panel performs less or if it degrades faster than 0.54% per year, they will replace that panel. Now, without something like Solar Edge, that would be a promise that would be very hard to right. hold the manufacturer accountable to. But right. because we couple this very nice, very extensive, very comprehensive warranty with solar edge that allows us to monitor at the individual panel level um this is what uh allows us to uh actually hold them accountable to right. uh, to this warranty which is which is pretty amazing so we talked about the the life of the panel and the guaranteed amount of energy production from it for the length of the the warranty and then potentially beyond there um, so I think we've done a, a like that, that really clears up for me, understanding the scope of, you know, how accountable the company is to creating something that once it's built, like th this is something that they're held to for that thing that they built with the carbon that they built it with to produce like 25 years worth of energy degrading only by 0.54% a year which I think is important because if we're environmentally minded and we want to make sure that what we're building is worth the carbon that it takes to build, that really handles that dimension of the question for me. Going back to the, the production, so you know we've answered that half of it like after you buy it, but as far as what goes into making the panel, as far as the carbon, 
to, to kind of determine the environmental benefit. Um, are there any estimates about, you know, how long it takes that panel to pay back the carbon that went into it? Um, obviously, it depends on the plants. Some plants are, you know, covered the covered the roof of the plant with solar panels, so maybe they would be less carbon intensive or whatever. But can you speak at all to the the like, you know, the resources that go into making the panel um, in general, or maybe from the the panel manufacturer that makes the the panels that Golden installs? So, so that's something that I probably want to get a little bit more uh, personally educated on before I really speak on it with authority. But generally speaking the two most uh, abundant uh, elements in a solar panel are aluminum and silicone. Hmm. Right? So, so aluminum is the metal frame that encapsules the, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole module. And mm-hmm. then there's silicone, which is the glass on the front of the frame, or I mean, on the front of the face of the panel and then, and then silicone, which uh, makes the uh, cell itself. And then the cells also have, uh, I wanna say phosphorus and boron, which constitute the, the positive and the negative uh, part of the, the, the cell, which is what allows the uh, photovoltaic effect to happen. Um, I, I, I can't really speak to how many years of production of a solar panel does it take, but, but uh, you know, it's definitely something I wanna get a little more research done. And, and I agree with you that that's definitely something that's worth, um, worth discussion. I mean, I think, is, I, yeah, go ahead. Is the Hanwha factory in Georgia, is, I've heard that that's solar powered, right? Like that they've got, that they're at least when they were designing it i heard that the roof of that was going to be solar which would make i would imagine the fractional you know carbon debt of each panel significantly less right so so there's a couple of different aspects to what is the carbon footprint of manufacturing solar panels and and so really you know you, you have to look at the entire life cycle uh, or, or I mean, I mean the entire manufacturing, you know, chain. And so it starts with extraction of raw materials, and then it goes to processing those raw materials and, and really a, a manufacturing and assembling the components. Um, certainly, if the plant itself is uh, solar powered, that will will definitely offset the energy needs of the manufacturing process, right? I would argue in a perfect world. I'd love to go all the way to the point that the, uh, you know, vehicles that uh, extract the raw materials are electric vehicles, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that um, would be really cool. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I want to point out about about this documentary that that you had mentioned earlier, which which really challenges, you know, solar and says, oh, solar really, uh, you know, doing good in the world, is changing from the model that we've come very accustomed to. In, in the last couple of centuries to where we're heading in the future, which is really a completely net zero, completely sustainable economy. That's not gonna happen overnight. Right. You know, so we're, we're, we're inching to it. We're taking baby steps. Yes, there may be a carbon footprint while we manufacture solar panels that allow us to offset our carbon footprint. And then, and then maybe the next step is gonna be that those vehicles that extract the raw materials are electric vehicles. And, and then maybe we perfect our process of recycling, uh, you know, materials so that so that we don't have to extract any new materials. I mean, sure. to me, to me, in theory, if we can return uh, materials back to their uh, form that, that they were when they were extracted, you know, why wouldn't we be able to uh, disassemble a solar panel and then melt it down and then, you know, manufacture a new one that's, that's even more efficient? we wouldn't need to extract new materials. So to, to me, kind of the big picture is that we're going from a model of extract and burn. And, and obviously in that model, because you burn something, you have to continue to extract something so that you can continue to burn that thing to a, a model of manufacture, assemble, build, maintain. And, and that's it. And once it's built, it's, it's there to be maintained. I mean, once mm-hmm. you build a massive solar farm, you, you have to maintain it. You know, you might have to wash down the panels to make sure that you're maximizing the light that's getting to that photovoltaic cell. But you don't have to build anything else. You don't have to extract anything else. Burn and anything most importantly, else. And you mm-hmm. don't have to burn anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's not perfect, but, you know, as we've seen, it could be drastically better than, than the current options environmentally. I mean, okay. the question to, to answer is, are we 
justifying the carbon footprints associated with, you know, making these these uh, products. Yep. And when we look at the life of the, of the products and in their proper use, I I would say absolutely. Right, and it's probably improving, you know, quickly as the industry matures and things like that. Um, definitely, definitely. So so we've been at this for almost seven years. Panels back then were 265 watts when we started. Panels today are 340 watts. Yeah. That's, that's I don't know, like a 40% improvement in, in five years. Right. That's huge. That's huge. And so, you know, we really need to focus on the big picture because there would not have been money for the R&D, for the research and development to take the panel from the 30 watt panel that I have in my garage that I bought on eBay for novelty <laughs> to the 265 watt panel that we used when we first started uh, to, to the 340 watt panel that we have today. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can't get hung up on this is where it is today. It's not good enough. Let's all abandon this and go back to burning coal. Right. We have to understand when we buy products from our manufacturers, some of that money that we give them for those products is going to go into R and D so that that product improves. And when you improve the product and you make a solar panel more efficient, that means it's gonna convert more light into energy. That means it's going to accelerate its carbon offset of the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And that's, and that's the benefit that the whole world has because yep. we've uncovered better techniques, better materials. So um, digging a little bit further into just gold and solar specifically, thank you for addressing kind of some of those aspects that apply to like every solar installer and every person looking to offset their carbon footprint. But digging into specifically gold and solar a little bit deeper, um, I think one of the frequently asked questions is related to subcontracting. And if gold and solar does that, can you speak to like, number one, why is it important, um, the, the subcontracting question? And number two, how gold and solar relates to that? For sure, for sure. When a homeowner uh, enters into a contract with a company to perform construction services on their home, there's a few things that they might overlook, which they probably should not overlook because they are incredibly important. The first thing that they have to understand is who is the business that they are entering into a contract to, and will that company subcontract the work or not? Okay, subcontracting is when you hire a contractor to perform work, and then that contractor then hires somebody else to perform some or all of the work. Okay, they mm -hmm. can hire some subs or no subs. Uh, like, like when you build a building, you hire a general contractor, they're definitely going to sub. Right? And the reason is specialization, because one company does the electrical, one company does the plumbing, one company does the mechanical, one company is going to do the shell, the structure, the concrete, one company is going to do the roof, and, and so on and so forth. Now, when you hire a company to do solar, if it's a regular solar project, in other words, just regular panels on a roof, inverter, interconnection, even with batteries, typically a regular job, the company should be able to perform that 100% in-house. And what that means when I say 100% in-house is that every single person that's performing any work on that property is a W-2 employee of that company. And that company has to provide them workman's compensation. So, so there's really kind of three aspects that I can think of right off the top of my head. The first one is you trust a company. You want to make sure that the people that are there actually doing that work is the same, are the same people as that company that you trusted to enter into a contract with. So if you trust company ABC, but company ABC goes and hires company XYZ, then you might not get that same quality of work that you'd come to expect right also you know if you're hiring a company that's just going to go and hire another company you might be spending more money than you need to because that begs the question why didn't i just hire the company that's actually doing the work in the first place is it so you, difficult from a liability standpoint too if you had some sort of problem you know is there going to be like no go talk to the subcontractor no talk to the gc or whatever D definitely. Yeah, definitely. So when you enter into a contract with a company, the party that is accountable to you is the, is the company that you entered into a contract with. Mm -hmm. Now, if that company then went and hired a different company, 
the, the co company B, subcontractor, is accountable to company A, the prime contractor. Um, but it, it might get really messy and really difficult for the owner to get right. company B to come back to the job and fix something. And company A might say, that's not my problem. Go chase them. Yep. So I would really recommend when you hire a company to do a solar job on your home to make sure that they themselves will be performing the work. So just a word about Golden Solar. Uh, Golden Solar has a, a solar license, an electrical license, and a roofing license. We do not subcontract any work on a typical installation. Mm -hmm. We may subcontract work in some very particular instances. So when we're doing a regular installation, which would typically be rooftop solar, we're not going to subcontract anything. But if when, when we do some kind of very exotic, very special project, we may hire a subcontractor. And so just an example of what that might be, we've done gazebos, we've done carports, we've done awnings, we've done, uh, you know, really, really interesting stuff. We had a, a concrete cover that kind of hovered over a swimming pool. Um, we might hire a concrete contractor to perform the, the concrete footers, right? So what we're looking at in, in these photos is a, a Lumos solarscape. So Lumos is a beautiful architectural solar panel that does not have a frame, so it's frameless. Mm -hmm. And the, the solar panels themselves are, are quite beautiful. Um, and, it's, and it's designed to be the kind of thing that you can have in your house and interact with and appreciate the, the beauty of, of the system itself. Besides just the fact that the solar panel is a workhorse up on the roof, out of sight, out of mind, producing mm -hmm. energy. These solar panels also look cool and provide a secondary function, which is, um, y y you know, shade. a place under shade. Yeah. When, mm -hmm. when you're going in and enjoying the day at the pool. So this is a Lumo solar scape. Now, Golden Solar, we're experts at solar. We're experts at roofing. We're experts at electrical. We are not concrete experts. Um, we live in Florida. We have hurricanes. We have to design for uh, withstanding, uh, you know, 175 miles per hour wind speeds per our building codes. And so that takes a lot of structural strength. You can see here, one, two, three, four uh, footings where basically the column from this solar scape are fastened to a concrete mm -hmm. pier that goes, that goes probably about six feet deep underground. So when the customer hired us, to do this solar scape, um, we did hire a um, concrete specialist, a concrete specialty contractor to, to, to do those uh, concrete footings. And we, we hired the tile uh, contractor to make sure that the tiles were perfect and beautiful uh, around those footings. You know, so, so we just, you know, we recognize that concrete is not what we do day in, day out. Tiles are not what we do day in, day out. So I'd, I'd naturally imagine that people that do concrete day in, day out and tiles day in, day out are better at it than us. So, but, but if, if we're doing a regular solar installation on a roof, we will not hire mm -hmm. any subs. And in, and in this case, we, you know, manage that relationship with the subcontractor. The owner didn't have to worry about it. We called them. We had them out there. We did make them answer to our quality assurance, quality control. So, so this would be an example of those very rare instances that we would in fact hire a sub. Yeah. Yeah. And I've met with this owner and he was very happy with, with the job. And um, I'm sure it, I'm sure it, some, there are specialty cases where you would want to get with other people, but, but that's good to know. Cool. A a absolutely. Um, in the normal circumstances, we're going to do things 100% in-house so our customers know that, that it's going to have the golden solar quality signature. Right on. Okay. Um, number three of frequently asked questions. We already answered number four, but jumping back to number three, let's talk about incentives for a second because I think everybody has heard that, uh, that there are perks to going solar, but they're not sure if there are you know, incentives in their area or from their utility or from their state or from the federal government. Can you kind of clear up, um, number one, what is available to people and for how long? And number two, what Golden's role is with, uh, with helping them take advantage of those incentives? For sure. The, the most important 
thing to know uh, in terms of incentives in the United States is that the federal government is giving out something that's known as the federal ITC. That's the investment tax credit. So the federal government is investing money in the form of tax credits to uh, help kind of kickstart the solar industry. So it's been around for a long time uh, for the for the purpose of getting people excited about, about solar and saving them money. And so uh, historically, since it's been around, the tax credit was 30%. So I like to emphasize it's not a rebate, it's a tax credit. You will only be able to benefit from that if you have a uh, tax liability. It's very important to emphasize that. Um, and, and if you do, then, then you can get 30% of what your solar system costs back. So if you bought a solar system that costs $30,000, 30% of that is $9,000. If you owe the IRS at the end of the year $20,000, subtract nine, you owe them 11. So it's been 30% for a long time. Uh, 2019 was the last year that it was 30%. 2020, it is 26% through the end of the year. 2021, next year, it's going to be 22%. And after that, it's going to be gone. True for now. The government might extend it. The government might change it. They might modify it. They might reinstate the 30. Nobody really knows. But true for now, it is, um, as, of, as of this moment, it is uh, 26%. And, and let's so drill other in than for the a federal second tax to the difference credit. in the different. Yeah. I was just say even even when my yeah go ahead even when we went solar there was still confusion about um it looks like my internet connection is a little wonky but the the difference between tax credit tax deduction and what rebates are just so people are clear if they're unfamiliar um you're talking about this twenty six percent as a tax credit how does that can you kind of run through how that would work as a deduction versus a credit versus what people would expect, like the idea of a rebate? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when you buy a computer in Best Buy and they advertise a $100 mail-in rebate, it doesn't matter who bought that computer. It doesn't matter what their circumstances are. It doesn't matter what their, their income and income tax uh, liability is a rebate is something that everybody gets based on a certain set of circumstances or a certain amount or a certain type of you know rules. I would say if anybody ever tells you that there's a rebate on anything, say who's giving the rebate, what do I need to send in, what are the rules, you know, un understand it. Um, so a rebate would be something that is independent of somebody's tax circumstances. Now a tax credit is very different than a rebate because nobody's just going to send you money. The tax credit is a deduction from your income tax liability. So if you have an income tax liability, and an income tax liability means you owe income tax to the IRS, then uh, you will uh, basically be able to get that uh, income tax liability back uh, in the form of a tax credit, right? So if you don't have an income tax liability because you're, let's say, retired, then you're not going to be able to benefit from a tax credit. So, so that's something very, very important to be mindful of. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that you know you definitely want to be weary of if you have a solar uh, consultant from a different company, if they promise you a tax rebate, be very uh, skeptic of that because it's a tax credit. And if you don't have income because you're retired then um, you, you, you might not be able to benefit from the income tax liability. And how does the credit work versus the deduction, just for people who may not be sure about that? So how does what? So, so like, e e even when we went solar, we, we wanted to check with an accountant about the credit versus the deduction. I mean, a credit is more substantial or more beneficial than just a deduction. Some people feel like the solar, that's the solar tax credit serves as an deduction, deduction, but it's actually a, a credit, right? So it's a tax credit. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's important to make the distinction between income tax liability and taxable income. So for example, you can have deductions from your uh, income tax, from your, from your taxable income. So 
you know, the way the way the taxes works is you figure out what your your income is that's taxable, which is all of your income mm -hmm. minus all the deductions. And then when you know your taxable income, you know how much you have to pay the IRS in income in, in tax, income tax. So when you have a, a deduction, that's a deduction from your taxable income. In other words, a deduction from the amount of money that you made that you're going to apply a percentage uh, and, and, and pay the IRS. That's, that's a deduction from your taxable income. This is not that. This is a deduction from your income tax liability, meaning after you've calculated your taxable income, then you are going to uh, know you're going to calculate what your income tax liability is. So your income tax liability is how much money you actually have to pay the IRS. That's what this is a, is a deduction. So a tax credit, as opposed to a tax deduction, is a deduction against your income tax liability. In other words, how much money you have to pay the IRS. And, and one thing that I wanna point out is this can apply in either situation of if you're self-employed and you pay your taxes at the end of the year, it's a deduction from what you owe them at the end of the year. Or if you work for, for a corporation and every pay period, they've already deducted some money out. And at the end of the year, you don't owe the IRS because you've already paid them, then you're gonna get that money back. You're gonna get the, the amount of the tax credit back, right. assuming that the tax credit was not greater than, than your uh, in, income tax already paid. It's not like you're gonna get punished because you paid them right. your gotcha. income tax early. Right. So, so just to recap, so that, other than I that, there right, are going to be the other deduction incentives. would count against how much it's based on. I'm sorry, I'm getting a delay. I, I was sorry to talk over you there. You are saying? So, so what I wanted to say is that is the you know biggest and most important um, incentive. Is a, is is a federal investment tax credit because it's it's for the entire United States. It's something with the IRS. Uh, but in addition to that, there's going to be a local, state, and, and and county level incentives. And the best way to look up what's available to you is to go to the website desireusa.org, and that's d s i r e u s a dot org. And they have a map of the United States, and you 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 pick your state. And you can search it by uh, region, by, by category. Uh, you can search if it's, uh, you, you know, you can search it by a bunch of different categories. And this is going to have, this is a database. This is a database of everything that, that exists that's classified as an incentive to go solar. So we talked about, you know, the federal tax credit, but there's other things, right? There's other things such as, um, basically there's a, there's a property tax exemption. So for example, your property value goes up because you did a real improvement. You, you put more money into your property because you went solar, then your property taxes are not going to go up because of that cost, uh, because of the value addition to your home. That's, that's in Florida. So this is a database that's going to have every single incentive that exists. And, and this is a really cool place to uh, spend some wow. time and learn what, uh, what incentives are available. This is great. This is the first time I've seen this. Here's the, the REAP grant here, which is cool for businesses. Um, great. Okay. Well, um, what, what's gold? Just real quick, what's Golden's role in tax credits? Um, will they help claim the tax credits for, for people, or how do we help customers get their tax credit? Sure. So Golden Solar is a solar contractor. We are not a tax preparer. We are not tax experts. We do not uh, represent ourselves as tax experts. And I wanna make this you know, very clear. In our contract, we really do advise our customers, please seek the advice of a tax expert. Always important to do that. Um, we, we're, you know, we do solar. And so we are aware of the incentives and, and benefits in the solar industry. And so we're happy to talk about that, but I'm not gonna dive, we're not gonna dive into our customers uh, income and, and look at their taxes and tell them how much they can expect to get back or not uh, get back. So we advise all of our customers to advise an expert and, and right. in particular somebody that's familiar with their situation 
in particular, what we can do and what we're always happy to do is point our customers in the right direction. So uh, the IRS, uh, you know, it's very, uh, you know, clear. It's it's a, a tax form. It's uh, the IRS tax form 5695. You can just go in and Google IRS form 5695, and you can find the actual form. You can find the instructions for how to fill out the form, and then um, based on that, you know, you can you can give all of that to your tax preparer. So what they need to do is take your total solar contract amount, enter it into the form. It's going to multiply it out by 0.26, right? 26% tax credit. And if it's all collectible in a first year, great. They'll get the whole tax credit back in the first year. If their income tax liability is less than the tax credit, they can in fact roll the, uh, the, the remainder credit into the subsequent year. But basically we, we're not going to file this on behalf of our customers, but uh, we, we will, uh, you know, share what's out there and, and let, let our customers do this with their, uh, you know, tax advisors. Got it. Great. All right. So this is, I think this is the last question we have here from, um, from our webinar here, but uh, if someone has a friend who they think would be a good fit for solar, um, what should they do? Well, the first thing they should do is contact us. And when they do that, uh, we would love to have them basically share their uh, their friends' contact information with us. So they can they can do they can do two things. They can tell their friend about Golden Solar and have them contact us, and they can tell us about the friend so that we know. And and Golden Solar we we do offer a financial incentive for anybody that wants to refer somebody to us if it becomes a contract if it materializes into business uh, for us. That's our way of saying thank you for trusting us to uh, to do business with your with your contacts. And you know we will offer a no cost, no commitment consultation for your friends, family member, neighbor, whoever. And if uh, if they like what we have to offer, they can sign up. And uh, that's just you know that many more solar panels that are installed on planet Earth and that much more carbon dioxide offset. So. Um, it's a, it's an exciting industry to be in, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take a lot of effort for, for humans on planet earth to change our ways and, and, and transition into a renewable energy uh, economy, renewable energy world. And so every, every bit helps. If you've got somebody that you know, that you think that can benefit from solar, uh, we would love for you to, uh, you know, share that, that person with us. We have a very nice handy, uh, contact, uh, form where you can enter the person's information and uh, it'll, it'll get to us. We'll know to give you credit as a thank you for giving us that contact. And so here's the form. Um, if you wanna reach out to us, we'd be happy to email you the link to that form. Otherwise it's ambassadors.goldensolar.com. And so this form, uh, you know, here's our terms. We'll give you $500 if, uh, if, if we can make that uh, referral a contract. You're just going to have to give us their name, their email address. Uh, you want to scroll down there and see what else we need to know. You know, who in the company do you want them to talk to? If you have experience with one of our sales reps and you've already developed that relationship and you like that sales rep and you want that sales rep to talk to the, the lead that you're referring to us, you can put that in there. Uh, this is where you can read uh, the terms of our, of our ambassador program. But, uh, you know, our, our objective is to get as much solar in as we can, to do it as high quality systems as we can, the best materials, best workmanship with the quality signature that you've come to expect out of Golden Solar. That's great. That's great. And I'm sure that given the quality of installations that you do, that this is a great way for the message of solar to spread and also to help, you know, more people offset their their usage and start to save money. So it's, it's great that this is available for people to be able to plug their info in and, and maybe even make some extra cash for spreading the word. That's it. Yeah, exactly. We are Great. all in this together. Darren, is there anything else? I think that that's all the questions that we had submitted here. Is there anything else that you would like to, you know, to touch on? Um, you know, I know next week we're going to be having Gray Reed and Phil Stoddard back on to talk about, um, to talk about, 
you know, looking at climate and powers of 10, uh, which I think would be really interesting. But do you have any other news or, or things that you'd like to sign off with? You know, we we covered a lot of the territory here. So really, I just kind of want to sign off with uh, where we started. If you want to go solar, it's never been a better time. Tax credits, 26% this year. Next year, it's dropping down to 22. Give us a call. Okay, our consultations are free, no cost, no commitment. We will spend as much or as little time, you know, with with you as you like. We will answer all of your questions in whatever level of depth that you like. And if you sign up now, you will benefit from a 26% tax credit when you do your uh, taxes for, for this year. And if you get solar and uh, battery backup, we recommend Tesla Powerwalls. Golden Solar is a Tesla Powerwall certified contractor. The uh, Powerwalls are beautiful product and, and they're really amazing because they're an AC coupled battery and you can actually back up your entire house. So give us a call. We'd love to uh, help you out and, and we'd love to help uh, offset your carbon footprint. Great. Thank you so much, Darren. Uh, before we go, I just want to give a little bit of a preview as to what we're going to be seeing next week from, from Gray Reed. Um, this is her project that she's been putting together. I'll let her go into detail with it next week, but you can see we have uh, the perspective of a billion years ago versus a million years ago versus 10 years ago, a year ago. It goes up in multiples of 10 each time. So 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, you can see uh, you know, if we decide to make improvements to society or if we don't. So she's going to be sharing some of her research, and I think that's going to be a really interesting perspective. So uh, please tune back in next week to to learn about that. Uh, this has just come out, so this is this is some really you know cutting edge kind of stuff that we're happy to be able to share with you. So um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Be sure to, um, to help spread the word about solar, and thanks for thanks for listening.